All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, you know you're only encouraging bad behavior on my part by keeping showing up to these functions, but um, I assume since you're here, you're also interested about every option that we can think about for the mill pond and the discussion that we're having in town about the management of it. Um, you might remember I had Beth Lambert come here in November of 2010. She gave sort of a primer on dam removal 101. And that DVD is, <laughs> is in circulation at the library. This event is also being filmed for MVTV, and it will be in circulation at the library. It will be running on the Channel 13. Um, after Beth came, I, hey. <laughs> um, I've been meeting a lot of people, talking with a lot of people about dam removal, about stream restoration, and there is a whole fleet of people out there doing this full time, all the time, all over the Northeast. Um, the more I learn about it, the more excited I get. The benefits are huge. And um, so with the people I've been talking to, all roads have led to this gentleman here, Michael Hopper, who agreed to come down and give a talk about um, what are you going to talk about? Stream restoration. <laughs> uh, and how these man-made impoundments affect native stream fish. Uh, sea run brook trout and herring, namely. Um, American eel. You're going to talk about that. Smelt. I don't know nothing about fish. Um, so I actually have a sign-up sheet going around. I, um, if you haven't signed it, um, yeah, send it around again. Because what I'd like to do after today is if there is any traction for this idea or people want to learn more about it, I want you to contact me because if it's, if it's only me talking about it, then I'm going to stop wasting time and money on it because I want you all to get on board and if this is an option for the town, let's make it an option. Um, so I think without further ado, um, I have one more thing. <laughs> The reason I've been pursuing this is I see this discussion about the mill pond as a real opportunity for the town to look at how this impoundment has affected, has affected native fish for the last 200 years. Um, and I think we'd be, we would be irresponsible to have that discussion without talking about the native fish populations and the water quality of the mill brook. So that's why I've been pursuing it, that's why I talked to Michael, and that's why he's here. And I hope you all give him a warm welcome. And Let's get this party started. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Michael Hopper, and I'd like to thank Prudy and the West Tisbury Library for having me come out today. Um, I grew up in a town very much like this town here. I grew up in Wellfleet, out on Cape Cod. And uh, as a young man in the 1970s, I was an avid outdoorsman, did a lot of fishing, hunting and uh, never realized what a sea run brook trout was until I bought this, which was my second fishing book. And in here is a story about a girl and a trout written by uh, Belson here. And that story is what led me to your library today because in the early 1980s, um, there was a big stream restoration going on in Falmouth on the Poshnet River. And... Um, I became involved in the restoration project. Uh, at that time, it was mainly geared towards brown trout, which are an exotic species from Europe. And uh, over the next 25 years, I became more and more involved in coastal stream restoration in, here in Massachusetts and learned a lot about the history of sea run brook trout, which is something that I'm going to talk about today. And it's a, it's a history that's largely forgotten by most people. Um, these were America's first sport fish. Uh, back in the 19th century, and as I'll show you in a few minutes, um, it was really our first sport fishery going back before the American Revolution. So without further ado, I'm going to start my presentation, and I'm going to go right back here so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank you. And here you see uh, sea run brook trout from Red Brook, which is out in Wareham, Massachusetts. And I'm going to go through a little bit of history so you can understand what this fishery was like. Um, brook trout are our native species here in New England, along with Atlantic salmon. Uh, they spawn in the fall, usually over upwellings in um, our coastal streams here. And at the time of European contact, there were between 70 and 90 streams in Massachusetts that had these fish. We're down to nine streams now where these 
uh, where the streams have enough connectivity that they can go out to sea and come back. And uh, here you see the native brook trout range and uh, the coastal area of Long Island and Cape Cod was always the most uh, famous for uh, sea run brook trout fishing and people from New York would go down to Long Island and there were uh, famous Boston anglers, wealthy anglers that came down from Boston and fished the Cape streams. Um, here you see what's left of the wild brook trout fisheries in uh, Massachusetts. And it's pretty clear that in, here in eastern Massachusetts, because of land development and uh, dams, uh, we've lost most of the streams. Uh, originally, you would have had just as many red marks in the eastern part of the state as we see out towards the Berkshires in central Massachusetts. Um, here you see how many dams we have in Massachusetts. And that gives you a pretty clear picture. When you start losing the connectivity of streams, where the fish can't migrate up and down, particularly out into the marine environment, uh, you start to either segment the populations or uh, because they become so segmented, they'll just become extirpated or die out over time. Um, where we get a lot of the history um, on fishing is from people's journals. And John Rowe is probably our most famous uh, gentleman before the American Revolution that uh, fished these streams. He was, of course, a Boston merchant and owned one of the <laughs> Boston Tea Party ships. Uh, and he kept a journal from 1764 to 1779. And he was an avid angler and went on fishing trips in the spring and fall almost every week. And he wrote about these in his journal. And one of the most interesting trips that he made was he went down to the Monument River. And for all you people that don't know what the Monument River is, uh, it's now the Cape Cod Canal. <laughs> so that was once one of the most famous trout streams in the country uh, at the time. And he went down there and caught 10 trout up to 18 inches. Well, an 18-inch brook trout is something that anglers now will travel to Maine and spend thousands of dollars a week at to stay at a, a, a camp or a lodge up there. So uh, they were, these brook trout were pretty much everywhere in the coastal streams. But starting... Um, <coughs> Early on with the uh, arrival of the pilgrims, um, streams started to be dammed up, much like Millbrook was. Uh, and they were, usually it began as grist mills uh, for grinding corn. And later they became sawmills and, and different types of mills. But uh, most of the coastal streams were blocked up with dams, which ended the connectivity. And uh, at that point, then the brook trout can't get out in the marine environment where they can grow much bigger than their non-migratory brethren which stay in the streams. Another famous angler was Daniel Webster right here. And he had, one of his most famous uh, speeches was the Bunker Hill Address. And he wrote that while he was fishing in the Mashpee River. Um, so, and another interesting note about Daniel Webster was uh, before he was in the US Congress, he was a state senator to, to, uh, uh, in, here in Massachusetts. And he passed one act while he was uh, senator here in Massachusetts to the, to the state senate, and that was to, the, to, ban the, uh, to ban the use of nets in collecting brook trout, uh, because they used to net the Cape Cod streams and bring those fish up to Boston and sell them in the market uh, just before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and the, the etching here is Daniel Webster catching a big brook trout down the Carmen's River down on Long Island. Uh, it was, it's quite a famous fish down on Long Island. Um, another place we get a lot of our uh, historical notes on these fish is a book called The Natural History of Massachusetts <coughs> that was published in 1833. And the author, Jerome Smith, was, uh, he was the physician of Boston at the time. He was later a mayor of Boston, uh, but he also came from a wealthy uh, Bostonian family and spent a lot of time uh, fishing the Cape Streams. And the, the first half of the book is a natural history of the fish of Massachusetts, both freshwater and saltwater. But what's interesting about this book is there's an essay at the end of the book that's all about fly fishing, and it's all about fly fishing for sea-run trout down on Cape Cod in the Quashnet River, the Mashpee River, 
um, monument Brooke he talks about a lot. But then he came over to the vineyard and he saw the trout stream here, which is Mill Brook, and there was a greater abundance of trout here than he'd ever seen uh, on Cape Cod. And you can see here um, the quote, he caught 70 trout in one day at the Quashnet River. And then coming over here, he saw, he saw them even in greater numbers. Um, another famous angler in Massachusetts was Theodore Lyman. Uh, Theodore Lyman uh, was uh, Commissioner of Fisheries from 1866 to 1882. He was also a U.S. Senator, as well as an aide-de-camp to General Meade during the Civil War. And there you see him in his Civil War uniform. Um, the Lyman family is a, a Boston Brahmin family, wealthy Boston Brahmin family that made their money in the China trade. And um, uh, he established the first fish hatchery on private land, um, which was owned by Samuel Tisdale. And he later uh, purchased pretty much all of Red Brook uh, in Wareham. And you'll see more about that later on. But what's what was important about that uh, purchase was he basically preserved an entire stream and, and the entire um, uh, riparian zone around it. Uh, and it stayed in the family until uh, 1990. So uh, if there are any anglers in the room, I'm sure you all remember Hal Lyman, who, who started Saltwater Sportsman. That was Theodore Lyman's uh, grandson. And uh, Hal Lyman had the property up until 1990. Um, that's what a big sea run brook trout looks like. And uh, that's a 16 inch fish from Red Brook. It doesn't look like the little brook trout you see in, in mountain streams. Uh, it's a very robust and, and different looking fish. And that's because of the marine environment where they have pretty much an unlimited amount of food. Um, the problems with dams like you have here on Mill Brook are <clears throat> one, it traps sediment. Uh, and more importantly, it blocks fish passage. They can't move around like they could. They've lost the connectivity. It also warms the water and can pose safety issues uh, downstream. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Quashnet River, uh, which underwent extensive restoration. This is the stream that I first got involved in. Uh, here you can see it's pretty much a cranberry bog in the background. Mm -hmm. And this picture uh, is right around 19, between 1953 and 1955. Uh, it was still a trout stream, but it had undergone a lot of kind of abuse when they turned it into a, a cranberry bog. Um, in 1975, Fran Smith, who's the gentleman on the right there, uh, started a conservation effort in the town of Falmouth to not only restore the stream, but preserve the land around it. Uh, since then, uh, tens of thousands of hours have gone into improving the stream. And you can see that, that picture's from the 1990s. You can already see the difference in how the stream looks with the vegetation coming back. Unfortunately, that's sweet gale, which poses some of its own problems. But some of the things they did on the Quashnet River was they stabilized the banks. They put in uh, these um, overhead covers. And, uh, and planted a lot of trees to shade the stream uh, because all those trees had been removed when they turned it into a cranberry bog. They also added deflectors, uh, like you see here, to kind of deepen the stream and then move the sediment and silt out of the stream that had been collecting uh, since the time it had been a cranberry bog. Um, this is kind of an interesting graph because uh, during the 1980s up until 1991, this the Quashnet River was being restored for a brown trout fishery, a sea run brown trout fishery. And the biologist back then, his name was Joe Bergen, never thought that we could um, bring back the native brook trout <clears throat> to the Quashnet River. He thought it was just a done deal. They were a very small remnant population up in the headwaters. And uh, they'd never really be able to recolonize the stream. Well, actually, Joe Bergen was wrong, because as they restored the stream, in 1991, they stopped stocking brown trout in there. And what happened uh, over the next 20 years was the brook trout recolonized the entire stream. And the years that you don't see any data there, that's only because those are years that it wasn't sampled. These numbers come from uh, fish sampling by uh, Mass Fish and Wildlife uh, from Steve Hurley, who's now our biologist for Southeastern Mass. Uh, and he can't get to every stream every year. 
but you can see a dramatic, uh, a dramatic growth in the population of sea run brook, uh, sea -run brook trout here uh, just because the habitat was restored. <coughs> and that's what, uh, that was kind of the object that we were after right there. That's a beautiful wild native sea run brook trout from the Quashnet River from 2001 when we do, we do uh, electro fishing sampling down there to, uh, to look at the population. <clears throat> Another thing that we've done is we've done genetic sampling because uh, a lot of naysayers said, oh well we've lost the wild fish and really all we're seeing is um, uh, uh, reproduction by the hatchery fish. So um, Brendan Annette, who is that gentleman right there, uh, did a uh, master's thesis at BU looking at the genetic uh, makeup of three streams on Cape Cod, uh, the Santuit River, Mashpee River, Quashnet River, uh, one on Long Island, and comparing it all to the, to the sandwich hatchery strain of fish. And something remarkable came out of this that <coughs> none of us really suspected. Um, it turned out that every single stream that we sampled not only wasn't tainted by the sandwich hatchery strain, each stream had a unique strain of brook trout in it. In other words, that each stream genetically was identifiable from the stream next to it. So that's very important when it comes to, um, to a population genetics, that you, that you have that kind of diversity in the population uh, in genetics. And none of us really suspected that, but it was, it was kind of groundbreaking. And, um, that helps us with management issues. And here you see uh, a couple of biologists putting pit tags in, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, pit tags are these very small uh, tags, and, and pit stands for passive integrated transponders. And the tag is about the size of a grain of rice. Um, it doesn't need a battery, and it has its own identifiable, unique number to it. And it works exactly like Easy Pass does on the turnpike. Uh, so right here you'll see two um, PVC bars, and those bars have an antenna array in them. And as the fish swims through, uh, the, that antenna, antenna array picks up the data from the tag and puts it into that device right there that just basically, it's a computer in with four car batteries and stores all the data on fish moving back and forth through that, uh, through that antenna array. And it reads the tag, the date and time, and the reason that there's two of them is so you can tell which direction the fish was going in, whether it was going downstream or upstream. Uh, so, and this is all new technology that's just been developed in the last 15 years. So we've actually learned a lot about pit tagging, through pit tagging, about fish movement in the Quashnet River, and it was a joint effort between Webner, which is uh, the state agency on Coit Bay, uh, USGS, the Conti Lab up in Turner's Falls, Trout Unlimited was a very active partner, as well as the Division of Fish and Wildlife here in Massachusetts. And here you see Coit Bay, which is where the Child's River comes in, and that's the Child's River right there. The reason I show this slide is it's very similar to your great pond here. The only difference is that this has a permanent opening down here. But other than that, it's, it's very similar to what you have here. And um, 